Well, as, as part of my research for this chat, I did speak with the Reverend Troy Perry. And he told me that you're not afraid to talk about anything, so I hope he's right. <laughs> well, some things I don't dare talk about. <laughs> at, the, at the 30th IML keynote address, you challenged the crowd to make history in the current election by either electing a woman or a black man to be the next president. And Obama won. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, anything I could say would just be a repetition. You know, it's making history. There's no question about it. I can't think of anybody more qualified to be president of the United States than Barack Obama. You know? And if you want to throw a little bit of humor at it, um, who was it the other night? Uh, the radio commentator, uh, Bill Maher. Rush Limbaugh. Bill yeah, Meyer. No, no, no. <laughs> Bill Maher. Bill Maher, yeah. He said, nothing has changed. He said, we're sending a black man into the White House to clean up the white man's mess. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Let's. Troy say again? <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't afraid to talk about anything. I, I think I have my hands full. I'd like to go back in time a bit. Tell us a little bit about your coming out. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I can't really pinpoint a time when I came out. I was always interested in guys. Now it's true when I was in high school I dated women and had a few and did different things this but um, when I was in high school, I joined a club called the Masking Shears, which is a dramatic club. And uh, I was in the play Arsenic and All Lace. And um, I forgot, a Dr. Witherspoon in there. I don't believe what I remember. I played several parts. But there was a guy in the cast one day, and after the show, we were backstage, and uh, he went down on me. Huh? Flash, flash, everything went off. <laughs> I <got> it went <laughs> Phenomenal. I read that you had a little bit of trouble hiding that in high school. Yeah, but not that much, you know. Just kept to myself. But I'm, tell us a little bit about your family. How did you begin the Renslow family? <laughs> well, just because you're gay, don't, I do not believe you cannot have a family. And that's been my motto ever since I met Doug. I think maybe the instigating thing of doing the family is when I met Doug. And uh, I met his family and his mother. And she was so open and, and wonderful and agreeing. Let me give you an example. When my mother died, she was with me at the, at the funeral. She reached over, grabbed my hand, and said, now you only have one mother. And that was family. And to this day, I believe, anybody who comes in, if you ask me who was family, I'd have to say that would be up to the individual. How many people do you consider family at the current moment? Family, <laughs> five or six. Okay. Uh, extended family, a couple hundred. <laughs> I consider in this room my family. Let's put it that was wonderful. How many children have you raised? I don't know. remember. <laughs> <laughs> partially, holy, Gilbert was here. He partially raised him. <laughs> Johnny over there. I'd see a six or seven, eight. I, I heard you're very hands-on in taking <laughs> care of children. How do you manage that? What are my hands-on? I think hands off, but I don't want to slap them. <laughs> <laughs> if you mean sexually, I'm not interested in kids. I'm not a priest. <laughs> <laughs> so I I've seen footage and I, I've heard that you have very massive and, and involved holiday dinners. How many people do you include in a holiday dinner at your home? Well, outside of close family, of course, I sort of put an invitation out that anybody we know in my businesses or anything else that, that has no place to go on Christmas or Thanksgiving are invited to my house for dinner. We've had up to 70 people. My gosh. My gosh. Well, I, I also read that your family observes a holiday tradition and that you see something 
in particular every year. What do you go to see as a family? Got me on that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> the the uh, the stage plays that you go to see. Oh, I, well, I don't know if that's so much a tradition because the kids got bored with it. I used to go to see the Nutcracker. There you go. And uh, very much so in the early years, I saw the Nutcracker quite a bit, but not so much as a family tradition. But Don, my lover at the time, was a dancer in it. You see, and uh, he was the uh, Oriental, one of the Oriental dancers. And that's why I went heavily. But yes, I do like to take it, but the kids now, uh, after they've seen it five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to change gears a little bit and look at some other aspects here. I, I read in some interviews here in the archives that your grandmother was a witch. Was what? A witch. And that she... She practiced it on the occult, yes. And, well, I read that she had, in Old German, um, the sixth and seventh books of Moses. That's correct. What did she teach you? Well, I can't say too much because once again when she was trying to teach, you gotta remember that I mean I was just a youngster, 18, 19, and I was like any other guy, I want to get out of there, I didn't want to listen to all this stuff, you know. So I can't say I learned an awful lot except a kind of a way of life, uh, which she was uh, doing to others and that, that sort of thing, you know. But I think the thing that she really gave me, and I don't know if it was from that so much, is a strong sense of discipline, self-discipline. And I believe I still have that to this day. You know, she was extremely strict. Um, I could always tell the story about the dinners. You know, we could sit, I could go to dinner, I could sit down, and I didn't have to eat. Didn't care. But if I took food, I had to eat it. And one day I took a pork chop and left it lay. The next day she went out of her way. And I mean went out of her way to cook every single thing in life, including baby. And I sat down to dinner and the pork chop came out. <laughs> <laughs> now in fairness to her, I took about two bites. And she said to my mother in Germany, you can't learn it. That means he learned. <laughs> but that is true, that's how strict you were. And I think that's what I got from her, more than anything else. A strong sense of self-discipline and a business acumen. But all she had. She owned the Kimball Trust and Savings Bank. And she lost that in 29 when I was born. Phenomenal. My research tells me that you practice magic in various forms. What does that mean to you? <laughs> well, it's a study of the cult. And um, I think we can define it just to switch down into ritual. Um, I believe, and I know I'm not alone, Crowley was with me. That uh, and anything in magic is what somebody does in their own mind. But what we do in spells and incarnations and all this stuff is mainly ritual or something to put our mind in the right way of doing it. The Bible says, you know, with enough faith you can move a mountain. Why don't people move mountains instead of having bulldozers? Because they don't have the faith. But if you have the faith, it works. And I believe that's what magic is. And I have practiced it. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. But, um, in switching gears a little bit again, you're a Mason, and that encompasses many aspects. Would you please educate us a little bit about Mason, being a Mason? What does that mean? All right, the Mason is a brotherhood. Uh, it's based on brotherly love, relief, and truth. Any man can become a Mason but not men, all men should be Masons, but all men want to be Masons. You can't, well, I, as a Mason, cannot ask any other man to become a Mason. They must ask me. The em emphasis of Masonry is to make good men better. And that's basically what it do. And we say the true Masonic ornaments, brotherly love, relief, and truth. And I think that sums up Masonry really in a nutshell. There's a political side of it and everything else, too. You know, I'll give you an interesting thing. Uh, I was named District Deputy Grand Master. Now what it is, there's 700 and some lodges in Illinois. The Grand Master can't possibly see all of them. So he divides the state up and then he appoints a deputy. Well, I appointed me as a deputy. And I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm openly gay. I don't know if this is a good idea. So I traveled to Springfield to see him. And I went into his office and I said, uh, uh, Grand Master, I have to tell you something. And John Loudon. And he said, what? I said, well, I'm openly homosexual. He said, well, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a wasted trip. <laughs> well, I'm 
told that you live your life as a Mason, encompassing uh, faith, hope, and charity as a way of life. How do you employ those tenets in your everyday life? I guess it's back to the same thing, do unto others, you have others do unto you. Uh, I, I believe that's a basic thing. But maybe the other thing is, if I see a bum on the street, or a beggar, or somebody asks for a haircut, if I have a dollar, they will get it. I, mean, I don't care what they want it for. I don't believe that's my business. People say, oh, don't give it to them, they're just going to go get drugs. That's not, <coughs> it's not mine. Charity begins at home, in my own heart. And if I give them their dollar, they do. I can't remember in a few cases where I've ever turned anybody down. <coughs> As a matter of fact, at man's country, sometimes they kid about these kids coming out. Oh, there's Chuck's fight on the line. <laughs> <laughs> I read that you do something uh, every other Thursday at the Hesperia Lodge 411. What do you do every every other Thursday for them? Go to a meeting. And cook. And cook. <laughs> <laughs> what do you cook for them? Well, anything. Any, no, I wouldn't say anything good. I go to Restaurant Supply Depot and be honest with you, what's on sale and there is what they get to eat that much that night. <laughs> Which sometimes can be great. You know, we were in there one time and they had fried rib half price because it was getting where it had to be moved. You know? Okay. And the lodge had fried rib that night. My God. What's your favorite thing to make? My what? My fa your favorite thing to make for them. If anything. I don't think I have a favorite, really. Probably roasts. Because I like the taste of them, and I like rare beef, and so that's my own taste, you know, what I like to make for people. I guess I like to make people what they want. I have a habit on somebody's birthday of saying, I'll cook anything you want. Oh it's got me in trouble a few times. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the things you've made for birthdays? <laughs> uh, what is it, um, beef Wellington? <laughs> Somebody asked for it. I said, my God, I've never made that. What do you do? Get the recipe book out. And, oh, my God, this is complicated. Huh. It's delicious. In fact, a friend of mine who's here tonight just asking me to make it again. That must have been pretty good. <laughs> in, in changing direction a little bit again, I'd like to talk about Dom, the artist ATM. How did you meet Dom? Well, I went to Oak Street Beach and uh, I don't know why, that, there was that time that Division Street and uh, Rush was the, the gay mecca. There was a restaurant there called State and Division, we called it Suck and Duck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I went to the beach, and I'm not a beach person, why I went to the, walk to the beach that day, I just, and I saw this little female, Filipino Italian boy laying on his stomach with a pair of blue trunks, and that little butt sticking up in the air, and the sirens went off, whistles went off, and I said, I want it. <laughs> There was another friend of mine there, Jim Clia, who I saw go up and talk to him. And I said, introduce me, introduce me. Uh, and he did. And Dom said, oh, hi, I'm Dom. That was it. And, okay. I sort of went to the background, and oh, about a half hour later, I came back up the way, and Dom was getting ready to leave. And I said, how are you getting home? He said, I take the bus. He said, come on, I'll drive you home. Well, on the way home, I said, well, can I pick you up tonight and take you to a show? He says, no. I said, can I pick you up tomorrow night? He said, no. I said, when can I? He said, all right, tomorrow night. <laughs> that started it. Don was not interested at first. In fact, after I asked him to go with me, he was 16 and I was 20. He said, but you're so old. <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did you get around that issue? <laughs> <laughs> In one interview where somebody asked Don that, I think he gave the best answer. He said, if you start at zero and absolute love is 10. He says, I started at 10, but he had to go one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Phenomenal. Don was an accomplished dancer, choreographer, but he has a very interesting footnote in Chicago broadcast history. Tell us a little bit about that. I don't know what you mean by Chicago broadcast history. It dealt with the television program? Oh, yeah, well, he was a choreographer and he was a dancer. Uh, some of the things was absolutely amazing and how the artists work here, all his work here, you see. But that wasn't his main love. He was very good at it. His main love was absolutely dance. I mean, he just loved to dance. He danced for the Illinois Ballet Company. I took several thousand photographs of him dancing. My gosh. And they're at the Newberry Library now. I'm 
into the Renslow Dance Collection. Something interesting about him, he was also a musician. And when my grandmother died, uh, she had a zither. It's a German thing like a harp. And I brought it home and I said, here, this is my grandmother. And he says, what is it? And I said, it's a zither. And he said, oh, and he started tightening up the strings and stroked it a few times and played the Bach and all from Tales of Hoffman, the melody, <laughs> oh <my laughs> three, which he knows was my favorite. Phenomenal. And he had never seen the instrument before. Phenomenal. You, together, you and Don established Chris Studios. How did you do that? Well, I was at a photography studio on um, Clark Street where I was taking portrait photography. I also did some female nudes and was selling them through the mail in her century studio. It didn't go very well. Uh, I think Johnny Orlowski is here, and he was up that studio with me. And, uh, a friend of mine, Harry Nicholson, came in and said, uh, you're a very good photographer. And I said, yeah, but I don't like it. Uh, I didn't like it because these heavy set fat women would come in and say, make me beautiful. And I felt like they, <laughs> I felt like say I'm not a plastic surgeon, but <laughs> it was just, they never liked it. It was difficult. So this friend of mine had said, why don't you take beefcake? So I started taking some beefcake. Dom, who I had just met, was very, very muscular. So I asked Donald if he would take some beefcake. And he said yes. And I took some photographs of him. I never sold them. I still have them. They're in the files. They were never published. But that's how I started. Uh, I'm not sure how the name, I know how the name came about. I'm not sure when, because Harry and I started the studio, and it's sort of lost in history where the name is. But the name Chris came from the fact we were trying to figure out a name for the studio, and I had a knife on my desk. And it was this wavy type knife. That's called a Chris. And Dom said, what's that? I said, it's a Chris. He said, that's a good name. <coughs> and that's how the name Chris Studio started. Phenomenal. Well, I read that you were charged with distributing pornography through the US mail. Tell us a little bit about that case, if you would. Well, <laughs> the post office moved against us uh, for sending pornography through the mail. Now, at the time, all we were selling were mail news with posing strips. The post office said that we had excessive strap delineation. I don't know why, just because I sold them water first. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but we won the case. It was a hearing in excuse me. It was a hearing in Washington, and we won. The problem is the modus operandi of the post office was that if you if they lost, you see, all they could do is prevent you from mailing. They couldn't do any more than that. But if you lost what they were hearing. They called the local police department and had you raided, which they did. And the police department raided us, and Dom and I, and uh, a model we had at the time, were all arrested. And the interesting thing was, when we got into court, my attorney was starting to bring art experts in and everything else. And I thought, this has been done for ages. Nobody's ever won. So I said, no, I don't want to do that. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't want to do anything. An attorney was an attorney from the American Civil Union. You know, he's really didn't care. He said, okay. So we got on the stand. And they asked me what these photographs were. The state's attorney, or whatever it was. And I said, they're pictures. And he said, what? I said, a man. He says, are they pornographic? I said, that's for you to decide. I don't think so. <laughs> well, we battered up and back for a little while. And finally, the judge, and I'm afraid of him, his name was Judge Dan Ryan, um, he said, let's see these pictures. And at that time, he also had some nudes without the photo strip that they had picked up in my studio. And uh, they put them all on the judge's desk, and he sat there going through them. It was kind of interesting. And he looked up, and he says, the human body is not obscene. Mm -hmm. And uh, the state's attorney jumped up and asked for a continuum. Why not? The judge, the, he said to the state's attorney, I'm going to rule against you. And he had these kind of glasses that you look over, and he looked over this way. And the state's attorney says, I have to demand a continuance. And uh, the judge says, yes, I can't deny that. And the state's attorney says something like a month away. And the judge says, I won't be on the bench. And the state's attorney smiles. <laughs> you can see that irritated the judge. <laughs> and he says, you have all the right in the world to a continuance. Nine o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> I walked into the courtroom and he said, oh, the Renzel case, picked up a gamble and said, dismissed. 
what, what was the interesting footnote with that where, where they couldn't determine that it was pornography, but basically it was considered, they couldn't prove it was pornography, but they couldn't say it was art. What exactly was the crux of that issue? Well, the point of it was at that time, there was no Supreme Court or any really legal definition of what was pornography. You were usually judged by the standards of the community where it was, you know, probably nude males at that time in Chicago, this was what in the 60s, uh, would be considered a pornographic. I mean, a lot of people would consider that. Um, so you were judged by the standard. All that changed, though, along the line when uh, a court case came to the Supreme Court of, uh, I forgot the name of it in the book, I forgot the name of the book, but it was uh, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure. It was a story about a prostitute. And the, once again, uh, they put them into court, and, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, if something has a lot of, of a social value, it is not obscene. And that was the one case. Another case was the manual case, which was a gay case. And up to this point, um, what the post office would do, they'd stop you from mailing. And you were out of business. You know. But manual went into court, and the Supreme Court ruled on it. They didn't rule whether or not the magazine manual, which was like the one I published Myers, was obscene or not obscene. But what they did rule was the post office had no right to deny you to mail it. Only a court could do that. And of course, that holds everything up. Those two decisions just, that's why we got the porno today. It's all based on that, those decisions. <clears throat> Phenomenal. In, in going back to Dom a little bit, we are seated in an auditorium named for Dom, the artist ATN. How does it feel to be here with him honored in this man? Well, it feels fantastic every time I come in here. I feel it. You get choked up with emotion. I just wish he could be here to see it. Phenomenal. That's, how did you raise the cash to buy this building? Well, I had some of my own equity debt into it. The big thing came though was we found the building. We had uh, Tony DeLaw and I had started the museum, and we had it up around Clark Street in the storefront. And we were scraping nickels and dimes to get it together. And a friend of mine called me up and told me about this building. I came and looked at it. I thought, oh my God, that's what we want. And I don't remember the figures. I think we needed something like um, remember? Do you remember what it was, John? Sixty thousand we needed. We needed sixty thousand dollars down payment. I had a couple thousand. So at International, Mr. Leather, that year we got on stage and I made a bid. I told him what it was. I told him the building. We showed the pictures of it, and I said uh, we need sixty thousand dollars to buy this building. I think we got something like fifty fifty nine thousand dollars in bids and collections that night. Phenomenal. And we bought the building. Phenomenal. And another footnote to that was we had a five-year mortgage on it, and that was completely paid off in five years. And that was the community. The community really supported, and it still is, you know. And we have some wonderful people right here. Jeff, they're great. Absolutely. I'd like to take a moment, if we could have the house lights for one moment, please. What I'd like to do is look at all the artwork that's decorating the auditorium. Can you tell us a little bit about this artwork, some of the history? Well, almost all of the artwork, except for one painting, or, oh, I'm sorry. All the artwork, except for three paintings, four paintings, were part of murals for the Gold Coast in one of its uh, locations. I mean, it's in five different locations. There's artwork here from all the locations. Okay. That one up there on the right, which shows a man holding like a star. That was done for a poster for IML. Okay. Also the one over here, on that small one, that was done for a poster for IML. The one in the very back shows car wash there. Kind of humorous. That was done by now for a uh, man's country bathhouse. The one over there in the corner was done for a disco I opened. <laughs> and the name of the disco was um, Zolars. It's magic is what I think. <laughs> well, caught on fire and burned. <laughs> so we went on saying, Zolars, it's tragic. <laughs> How did you save the artwork if the building burned? 
You know, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> no, the artwork was in back of the bar and over the bar. Oh. And uh, that part really didn't uh, didn't get that much damage. The rest of the place was just completely. Uh, there was a shortage in, from the railroad tracks next door. The elevated spark on the roof. Of the we had no insurance or nothing at the time. Oh no. Did Dom create all of this art? All of it, yes. What was his motivation? Can you can you tell us a little bit about how he created this? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, I, I can't tell you. I told him I wanted art for the basement of the Gold Coast. I wanted art for the Gold Coast. And he just took it from there. I mean, uh, he was extremely, I mean, I know he, he could really turn things into wonderful things. Like, for instance, that one back there in the corner, that's supposed to be him and I. Well, I told him, that don't look like me. And he says, that's the way you look to me. Oh, my gosh. And I still don't think it looks like me. <laughs> well, uh, if, if we may bring the house lights down, thank you. I'd like to talk about the Gold Coast a little bit and the bars that preceded it. Tell us a little bit about the Hideaway Bar. Where the Leatherman began congregating in the 1950s? The Hideaway. There were numerous bars. I recall that there was one of them. Well, they weren't leather bars. They were just plain bars. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, they were plain bars. And the leather guys did go into those bars once in a while. But it was a rarity. Um, in the uh, late 50s, 58, 57, Dom and I met Cliff Ingram, who became part of our family. And uh, Cliff, who uh, later went into tattoo artist, Cliff Raven. And Cliff said one day, well, we ought to know five or six or seven leather people. Why don't we all go to a bar and, and sit down and see if we can attract other people? So we did. We went downtown to a bar called Rose. <coughs> and uh, that was in downtown in the loop in Madison and Clark. In the daytime, it was a restaurant that closed up around 5 o'clock, opened up at 8 o'clock at night as a gay bar. Well, we were there about two weeks, and the management says, get out of here. You're scaring everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went to another place called the Lane Hotel across from the <coughs> square. Yes. It was going all right, except they tore the building down. So we had <laughs> then we moved to a bar on... Um, Broadway, and that was called the Hi Ho. Like we were cards that Tom made of it. It was Hi Ho Daddy O, and he had his picture of a motorcycle straddling the wheel. And we did very well there. We were there almost a year. And um, uh, that's it. by the way, it's still there at the bar. It's now Friar Tux, and it's on Broadway. But uh, the woman that owned the bar sold it, and the new owners didn't want us. So somebody told us about a bar called the Gold Coast Show Lounge that was at Elmer. Clark. It was always empty. So we went in there and talked to the owner, and he said, sure, come on in. You know, and we did. And we were there about three weeks, and he said to me, why don't you run the place so I can go home? <laughs> I said, all right, this was in 58. And uh, 59, he died. And his son came and says, you want to buy the joint? <laughs> we did, and that's how the Gold Coast started. We dropped the show lunch part. <laughs> <laughs> You, you had to move the Gold Coast a few times, Yes, if my, if my research tells me correctly. Yeah. What precipitated that? All right, the first, the first bar we had was at Ellen and Clark, and uh, we were doing very, very well there. And uh, we were, that was the one we moved into there. And uh, we had very cheap rent at the time. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to be doing very well, so it was okay. But as they saw we were doing well, they tripled the rent. And I mean, the rent really went up. And I thought, this guy's gouging us. You know, and I found out after a while, I was a big syndicate guy, which I didn't know, naive. And uh, so I said, well, we're going to move. So what we did, we went up the street and opened up another bar there. It was in a building owned by uh, Tokyo Rose. And uh, she didn't care. She rented us his store. And we completely built the bar, and obviously secretly. And we were all ready. We had a license and everything ready to open. We opened it up. And when somebody went to the old Gold Coast, they found the lights on, the murals gone, well, not the murals gone, they called the bartender there and said, oh, we moved half a block up the street. <laughs> and that's what happened. But, uh, it's one of the sad things about that bar, with the exception of one mural that's out being restored. Dom had painted murals there too, but he painted them right on the wall. <clears throat> and um, we didn't want anybody else to get in there, so we went in there at night one day and uh, we painted them, we were smearing them all up. 
And what was Jamie's time in relationship to the Gold Coast? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> in those days, you paid off to the syndicate, and you paid off to the blues. There were no gay bars, to my knowledge. Helix Hut, which was out of every part of Rhode Island, might not have been. But every other one was owned and run by the syndicate. When we opened up the Gold Coast, I was just really kind of naive. You know, they came in and told us we had to buy this stuff from that and the jukebox. had to be the jukebox company, which we did. But one of the things, we had a two o'clock license, and right across the street was a big syndicate bar called Jamie's that had no business. <laughs> so when we closed, we hollered, Jamie's time, and everybody went across the street. <laughs> put us in good with the outfit. Two things put us in good with the outfit. That was one, and I won't mention names because you know, those times are gone, but still. Huge syndicate guy called the Hunk, was his name, he came to see me. He had a cigar called him. Chuck, I got to talk to you. My son is gay, what will I do? <laughs> <laughs> what did you tell him? No, I had a nice long conversation with him. He sent the kid to St. Louis and bought him a bar. <laughs> <laughs> what was your inspiration for the Mr. Gold Coast contest that subsequently became IML? Well, when I had Chris Studio, we were always trying to get models. I worked out in the gym and, and uh, Don wore it down. And uh, we went to all the physique contests, Mr. Illinois and Mr. Chicago. And the guy that was running the physique contest at the time, this was before IFBB and it was the Amateur Athletic Union that ran it. And that was the weightlifting part mm -hmm. of the sport. They were heavy weightlifters. And the guy that was running in Chicago was a weightlifter and he didn't want anything to do with his damn physique stuff. So he asked myself and a guy called Cliff out of here, also a uh, to handle that part of it. So we did. We handled the Mr. Chicago, the Mr. Illinois, Mr. Midwest, and we ran those contests. So they gave me the idea, wow, let's try a Mr. Gold Coast. So we did. Well, the Mr. Gold Coast got so popular that uh, we had speakers out in the street. The bar was so full. So Dom said, well, we got to move it. So we said, well, okay, what are we going to do? I said to Dom, I said, we can't put the Mr. Gold Coast somewhere else. So Dom said, no, we can't. We've got to change the name. So he came up with Mr. World, Mr. This, and finally he came up with International Mr. Leather. Now, I will say in the early years with Mr. International Leather, International Mr. Leather, it switched everywhere around. <laughs> but, uh, Dom was the one that came up with that name, and it stuck. Phenomenal. What were your thoughts and feelings at the 30th anniversary? Wow. <laughs> and to do it, how far it's gone, and, and what's happened, and dedicated people to it, the people that have done so much work without much remuneration at all to make a success. I mean, if you'd have told me 30 years ago that it would develop into this, I, I wouldn't have believed it. You know, it, it it's, it's worldwide, it's known, and it's had its ups, it's had its downs, it's had its problems, but it's always survived, and I think it will survive. Absolutely. <laughs> been honored by many organizations, many people, but one in particular that caught my attention was when you were honored at Kinky College in a covering ceremony <coughs> in 2006. I had the privilege of attending that. And what I'd like to do is show a brief video of that. So I'm going to ask if I may move you over for just a little bit, you'll be able to look at that video. And I'd like your comments on that. I hope everyone can see. You can see all that.
<laughs> I don't know. I, I think that God. I guess flabbergasted me. I mean, I was surprised. You know, I've gotten honors, lots of them. And, you know, some, I'm, some of this because I was there. Some of them there. But this one, I really felt that this came from not necessarily a gay group, but a poly group, that, you know, a heterosexual group and everything. And I considered that a great honor. I really did. That. I would say, well, not so much a great honor, a very emotional thing. It was very emotional. It was, I don't think I've ever cried at somebody. I almost did it that one. <laughs> <That's awesome>. <laughs> <laughs> what honors or bestowments have meant the most to you over the years? I don't know. I, I tell you something, I would answer about any question you want, but that's one I don't think I would answer, and I'll tell you why. If I say this was better than this guy's going to get mad, if I say George was uh, the best one, then Harry's going to get mad, you know. All of them wonderful, all of them I thought just great. Some of them I think were connived, but so what? That's, that's <laughs> in, in changing gears a little bit again, moving on to a couple of lighter topics, <laughs> I read that at one point you moved away from Chicago for a short time to San Francisco. Yep. You opened a pet store. <laughs> and you used an animal and a parking meter for some <laughs> sort of publicity. Where did you ever find that out? <laughs> Would you tell us a little bit about that, please? Well, we had a pet shop there. It was doing very, very successful, Dom and I did. And um, we had a not a kangaroo, it was like a kangaroo, I forgot what A wallaby? A wallaby, thank you. <laughs> and uh, he was friendly, nice little thing. So I took him downtown on Market Street, and I tied him to a parking meter. And I put money in the parking meter. And then I called the police if there's a parking meter there. And then I called the Tribune saying, the police were arresting a wallaby. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, the paper carried the article. And I just walked up. I got my money in the meter. <laughs> the shop went like this and we went off, but we did get it in the paper. <laughs> so how long were you how long were you there with, with your pet store? About three months. Uh, we did not like living in San Francisco. That was one of those cities that Dom and I went to visit and had a wonderful time. We thought this is a great place. We wanted to move here, but we didn't burn any bridges back here. And uh, we just didn't like living there. I don't and I can't tell you why. I think maybe because we were homesick for here. I just don't know. But Chicago is my city, and uh, I, we tried to move once more another time, too. We tried to move to New Orleans. Uh, a friend of mine was in New Orleans. We went down there for Mardi Gras. God, what a wonderful city. So we, a friend of mine was living down there, and we visited him and said, well, we're thinking of moving down here for a while, you know. So he said, come down here in July and August before you see <laughs> <laughs> Well, this was before mosquito abatement. And we went down there in July and then toward the beginning of August. We were supposed to stay two weeks. We stayed about five days. Oh my. <laughs> Hot mosquitoes, bugs, no way. You've met many famous people over the years. Please tell us how you met former Chicago Mayor Jane Byrne and what she did for you. Uh, okay, I tried to get an interview with Jane Byrne through the regular diplomatic channels set it up and never even got a reply, you know. Um, she was sort of like Mayor Washington, you know, too many people around me was screaming it. And uh, so I got the idea, I called her husband up, he was Jay, and I said, Jay Mullins. And I said, Jay, I'd like to take you to lunch. She said, who are you? I said, I published her a gay life newspaper. He said, why do you want to take me to lunch? He was on the phone. I said, I want to get to your wife. <laughs> he laughed. He said, who's paying for the lunch? <laughs> and I said, I'll pay. And he said, okay. We went to a restaurant across from City Hall. I don't believe it's there anymore. It's called Mayor's Row. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sat down and had lunch. And he, I paid, by the way. And he, he insisted on paying. I didn't pay. Okay. Then after lunch, he says, come on, let's go across the street. Went across the street, walked upstairs, walked right into her office. He introduced me to her and said, he'd like to have an interview with you. And uh, she said, okay, when? I said, how about next week? She said, okay, gave me the date, time, told her secretary. I came there with one of my reporters uh, from Gay Life, and we had an interview. The thing about the interview was this was in May, in the May. And during the interview, he, the, the reporter was doing the uh, Kulaki, 
And I interrupted and I said, would you sign the executive order banning discrimination uh, in city employment? And she looked at me and said, yes. Well, I was floored. You know, when you talk to a politician, you expect, well, we'll take that under consideration. It's a good idea. But I didn't get that. She said, yes. So I said, when? And she said, next month's gay pride, isn't it? I said, yes. She said, I'll do it for that. <laughs> I have the original order she signed in my office here. Phenomenal. Just as a side note on that, a lot of people don't realize it. Myself, Bill Kelly, and other people were very instrumental in, building, in closing the city hall and the city and the city departments into the idea of civil rights for gays. I mean, when they finally acted, as a few people got most of the credit, but they were just pulling the plug. It was an awful lot of work done before. Just to give an example, and maybe I should go on it, but please. Old Mayor Daly, I was a precinct captain. Now, what he had before uh, any election, he had what he called his uh, precinct captain meetings. He'd take each ward and each table and a precinct guy. And he'd walk around, give him a name, pep talk. Well, I used to walk up to him and say, Chuck Wright, Chuck Renslow, gay rights. First, he didn't pay any attention to me. Finally, it took one old by year before he died. I would say, yeah, yeah, I know, Chuck Renslow, gay rights. <laughs> <laughs> About three or four months before he died, I was in City Hall with Oliver and Clifford Kelly. And we were standing there talking. And the mayor came out of his office, or no, it was by the, sit, by the uh, council meeting, came out of that, he had a special passageway. And he saw me, and he broke ranks and came up to Clifford and I and says, you know, Chuck, your time is coming. And why not? So there was a stupid politician. He knew that the gay rights was going to be passed eventually. And Clifford Kelly was there. And Clifford Kelly, by the way, was a black alderman on the south side who had no reason to support gay rights. But every year he put that bill in the city council. Phenomenal man. He's, I believe, does talk show on the TV, on WBON or something. Like that. Extremely pro gay and no reason to be. Incredible. Now, it just shows there's a lot of people out there that are on our side no matter what. We don't realize that. True. That sort of got the ball rolling because. On January 1st, 2006, Illinois became the 14th state to prohibit discrimination against gays and lesbians in housing, employment, public accommodation. You were part of that. How did that come about? How did that come about? Well, I can't say that I was a part of it, yes, but I have to emphasize I was just a part of it. There were so many other people uh, uh, that were doing that. I mean, the, I can't remember his name. Uh, our state, senate, our state representative, who was the first openly gay recommend. Larry McKeon, yeah, Larry McKeon, you know, a good friend of mine, in fact, he's a customer of ours, a leather man, and uh, he really fought for it. And it was too, you know, I can't, you can never say, or shouldn't say, and I never said that, any one person was a key to it. They weren't. It was a real team effort. I mean, there were many, many people working on it. And I think that you had to lay the groundwork. You know, you're not going to go into uh, the city council or the, or the state legislature and say, we want gay rights, here's the bill. They're not going to pass it. It takes background work and background work. Uh, recently they put in uh, the bill for gay marriage. And they said, well, don't call for a vote, it won't pass. We said, well, I know it won't pass. We don't want it to pass. But if we bring in civil rights next year, some of these people that vote against it, we can say, hey, wait a minute, now you didn't want this, how about this? Maybe that'll pass. I don't know. But I'm just saying, I'm just trying to show you how you got to balance all that politics and so many yeah. people have to be a part of it. No one person can do it. Some of them claim they can, but they're not. Tell us about the Orange Bowl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the Orange, the, um, what was the name? Um, Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant, yeah, I forget. You got <laughs> Anita Bryant was having this initiative down in Florida, you know, the anti-gay and very extremely. So everybody's trying to raise money to defeat her. And I had the idea of throwing something called the Orange Ball. And uh, we threw it at um, the auditorium uh, Aragon. Where was it? Aragon. The Aragon, thank you. The Aragon. And um, a lot of things happened. One, the night it was going to happen, I forgot what, I think it was a Sunday night, but I don't remember. And uh, yeah, I said, uh, <coughs> on, yeah. 
I called up, I think it was one of the other bars, and I said, I want you to close on Sunday, because we're having the Orange Bowl. And they said, who's closing? I said, well, I'm closing. And the guys, well, all right, we'll close. And so then I called another bar, and I said, this bar and that bar is closing. And I called every bar in town. <coughs> and most of them closed. The few that didn't close said, no, we'll give you all our money, though, from that night. <coughs> and we had quite an attendance, and it was very good. A side note for that, we had uh, Wayland Flowers mm -hmm. as the entertainer. And uh, Wayland Flowers and Madam, I don't know if people knew him, but he was really a dichotomy. He was two people. Mm -hmm. Madam was one person and he was another. <laughs> but he's backstage and he's, I don't know if I'm going to go on. I can't be seated at these big gay events. So, you know, I, I, I'm on my way up the ladder. i got to be successful. I said, just do your show. Said, I'm not going to mention anything gay. I said, okay, okay, well, said, please go on. He walks out stage, you know the first thing Madam said? Who's this bitch Anita Bryant? <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually meet Anita Bryant? No. Well, yes and no, I saw her. <coughs> um, down the lounge, right after that, uh, she came to speak at Manina Temple. And uh, we had a protest outside. You know, and uh, we got a call. They came to me with it and said that, uh, told us where Anita Bryan was landing, what plane, and she'd be in a limousine and what entrance she would come into uh, Medina Temple. And so I went up to where her, their offices were, talked to their people there, and I said, I got to talk to you about Anita Bryan's security. So we don't need you. I said, well, I said, we don't want anything to happen because it would look bad for us. I says, but she's landing on United Flight so-and-so, she's picking up this thing, the limousine is bringing her here, and it's coming here. How did you know? I said, we're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and what it was, the limousine driver called me. Or called somebody else who told me. Phenomenal. Tell us a little bit about former President Jimmy Carter visiting your home. Well, I went to a lot of his fundraisers and everything. And, uh, I can't say I knew very much. I, uh, was invited to the White House uh, for a dinner, uh, his birthday party, and that was very interesting. I was a heavy supporter of his. And, uh, but once again, I'm very active in democratic circles, and I think that was all. Would be, I didn't know him personally or anything like that. I was just a supporter of him, a strong supporter. Of course, I have a Barack, too. Yes. <laughs> I give you another side note on Barack. A friend of mine, uh, uh, Michael Bauer, is on his uh, team. He's a fundraiser for him. He's an advisor on uh, uh, gay, uh, gay items or gay issues. issues. And uh, Michael Barr, Ron, and I were driving down to Spring. On the, we were on the way back or on the way back? Way back. We were on the way back from Springfield and we stopped at uh, Shake and Steak to have a, a dinner. We're sitting there in the booth and Michael's uh, telephone goes off and he answered, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, Mr. Obama. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It was Obama telling him he was going to announce his running for presidency next week. Wow. <laughs> Phenomenal. Yeah. It was a, you know, one of the lots of calls. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't say Mike was the only person I told was seventy some people, but, but still. And so we knew it before before. Have, have you actually met Obama? Yes. Yes, I met him several times. Uh, Obama is a, say what you want, he's a brilliant man. Uh, I met him first at a fundraiser when he was running for state senator. And, no, I'm sorry, federal senator. And he was a state, I believe a state rep, I'm not sure. And uh, this was at the Green Dolphin. And I walked up to him and I asked him what his opinion was. I told him I'm a very like, gay activist. And he was obviously very pro-gay. We talked for a few minutes and introduced myself. Okay, that was it. You know, well, I got a picture taken with him, which I had in my office. And about three weeks later, I met him downtown at one of the hotels. I think it was the Conrad Hill or the, the Hilton. And uh, I walked up to him to say hello. I said, oh, yeah, you're the gay activist, aren't you? Now, you know, he didn't remember my name, but I think that was pretty damn good. When this guy's going to fundraisers every single yes. night to remember that. The man's brilliant. I'm glad he's going to be president. Phenomenal. But I read that you have an FBI file. What can you tell us about that? <laughs> I'll show it to you. Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. You see the and my mother's name, this name, that name, everything else, black cross, black cross, black cross. <laughs> it's a sheet that thick. 
And I don't think there's any more than 200 words, and they're all adjectives or something. Incredible. Yeah. What I should do is now under the Freedom of, Inter 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 Freedom of Information Act, I should reapply for it. This was done by Bill Kelly, and I still have the paper. Oh. And they were censoring it. It was completely censored. The only thing that was in there that got me mad was the fact that my mother got married after I was, just before I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever run for public office? No. Um, George Dunn asked me to run uh, for a state, I believe it was a state representative, no, it wasn't, it was a city, because it was alderman. As an alderman, I forgot which ward, this was so long ago, it was the old, the old coast, early days. And, uh, he called me in and uh, said, you know, they did a name recognition in the gay, gay community, and mine came up the highest. And he wanted me to run, and I sat down and I said, uh, no, I will hurt the party too much. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I run a leather bar. They're going to talk that into people beating each other up. Yeah. I said, I run a bathhouse. They're going to talk that into the house of prostitution. I said, none of that's true. But that's the accusations are going to be made, and it's going to hurt the party more. He said, would you run as a delegate? <laughs> I said, yes, and then I run as a delegate for Ted Kennedy. Oh. In a 1991 interview, you mentioned having been married to a lesbian. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's quite simple. We wanted a liquor license, couldn't get it in my name, because we had this porno, porno case, so I married her and put the license in her name. <laughs> simple as that, you know. A Where? wonderful woman. <coughs> herself, she was great. Where is she now? I have no idea. I'm oh. trying to locate her, and I have not been able to. I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, when the FBI was, in, was investigating uh, um, Mayor Daley, they called me in, and uh, Aunt Nam, was, this is quite involved, and they were questioning us, and they said, well, you're married, aren't you? And I said, yes. And they said, well, aren't you homosexual? I said, yes. I said, well, how can that be? And I said, well, just because you like peach pie, I don't mean you don't like apple pie, too. <laughs> <laughs> so then, this is the interesting part. Uh, then uh, the FBI guy said, oh, do you mean your marriage was consummated? And I discussed, we're discussing fruit pies, not my sex life. And when I tell you something, then my attorney objected, and they cut the whole thing off. <laughs> they didn't everything stopped. They called us back. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your Wisconsin farm. I think David could tell you back that. There's my lover David. He loved the country. He loved the farm. Uh, we went driving one day and we saw this sign up for a farm that had a pond on it and acres and whatnot. And I forgot how much it was. And we went and looked at it and David fell in love with it. And I said, okay, we'll buy it. It's still there. David owns it now with his wife. What do you do uh, with that farm? There's something very specific you do with some kids, maybe, or people here from the city? Well, yes. There were a time when the kids were, that I knew a friend of mine was hung up on coke or something. We were sending them up there, and David and Vicki <laughs> would work with them and everything and, and try to rehabilitate them. Most of the time, I would say it worked, and sometimes it didn't. I sent a friend of mine up there just a couple of years ago, and uh, when he stayed three or four days, and, Threaten to hitchhike back home. <laughs> but we tried, you know. On, on a lighter note, there's a very specific question you ask bartender applicants. What do you ask them? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't ask specifically. I think I have a statement that I make with them. Maybe that's what you mean. And then I tell them, I said, I don't care what you are, a top or a bottom, when you're a bartender here, you're a bottom. Says, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so the Eagle um, has just moved to a new location. What's prompted the move? Well, I've been in the bar business 50 some years. And to be honest with you, I don't want to be in the bar business. <laughs> Uh, I own the building where the Eagle was in the back, and uh, that's also Mad's Country. Mad's Country needs more rooms. So I was going to close the Eagle, and that's it. Jimmy, who was the bartender and the manager of the bar, said, Chuck, can I have the name and can I move it? So I helped him. I bought the building with him next door, and he is opening the Eagle there. I, I have see. nothing to do with it. 
I mean, I'll lend my support, I'll lend my name, but legally and technically I have nothing to do with it, nor do I want it. You know, 50, 52 years, 51 years of it are used as long as Although I enjoy it, don't get me wrong. But there's more money in men's country than there is in the body. Okay. Tell us about your garden. It's quite extensive. I what? Your garden? It's very extensive. Well, I don't think it's very extensive. I mean, it's a small garden in the back of the house. Uh, I work on it. I don't work on it as much as I used to. It's getting too hard to do all that damn weed. But uh, I try to make the garden so there is something blooming all the time. Right now, there's chrysanthemums blooming. And that'll be the last thing to bloom. And early in the spring, when there's still snow on the ground, the crocus start coming up, and then the tulips, and then the roses, and then the alium, and so forth. I always try and have something in bloom. Phenomenal. I'm told you have uh, a keen interest, a passion for sailing. For sailing? sailing. I love sailboats, yes. Um, I love sailing. I love to go on it. Uh, that all came about, well, I was in a merchant marine, but that's another story. Very funny story. Uh, Feel free. Yeah. Pardon? Feel free to share. All right. Share. I love to tell people about my experiences in the merchant marine. See? You know, that's just one. When one thing they never asked me, and that is how long I was in. You know how long I was in? How long were you? Four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was 17. I ran away from home and joined the merchant marine. Went to Southampton Docks, which is interesting. I went down in a submarine there even, and came back, I don't know, maybe six weeks, I don't know. Came back to uh, Sheep as Bay, New York, or no, the docks in New York. And uh, as I'm walking down the gangplank, there was my mother and a policeman. What oh. <laughs> 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 my marching marine experience. <laughs> How do you stay fit? I understand you have a very interesting workout routine. Yeah, I exercise, I try to watch my diet. Uh, that's a really it. Watch my diet work out. I work out, uh, I think I worked out ever since I met Don. Uh, we worked out together. He used to do ballet bar, and I worked out there, and I just never stopped working out. Uh, I think that's what go main, main, main reason for the reason. Then part of it's interesting too because I must have some long life genes in my family. Uh, my mother died early, my dad died early, uh, but my one. Uh, Grandmother, grandmother's sister, my old grandma also, uh, she was 96 when she died. And she died carrying a basket of wash up the basement stairs. She was tripped and fell and got a concussion. Oh. I know. So I don't know. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. And also I think it's a combination of keeping busy and attitude. You know, I try not to dwell on the past. I always try to